But now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, one of our own, most of you know, Dr. Kerry Ressler. Um, for those of you who don't know him, he is a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, and he has many roles here at the hospital. He's the James and Patricia Poitras Chair of Psychiatry. He's our Chief Scientific Officer and Ch Chief of the Division of Depression and Anxiety Disorders. Um, his work focuses on translational research, bridging molecular neurobiology and animal models with human genetic research on emotion, particularly fear and anxiety disorders, with a particular focus on civilian post-traumatic stress disorder. He's published over 250 manuscripts and texts, ranging from basic molecular and cellular mechanisms of fear processing to understanding how emotion is encoded in a region of the brain called the amygdala in both animal models and human patients. He's particularly interested in how developmental trauma affects the, develop, the developing neural circuits that underlie emotion, leading to increased risk for adult psychiatric disorders such as depression, anxiety, and PTSD. And today he's going to speak with us on neurobiology and molecular mechanisms of fear and habit, translation to PTSD and addiction. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Terry Ressler. Thanks so much, Chris, and thanks for all you do, Chris, for all of us. Um, it's such a pleasure to work with you on this and many other things. Um, yet again, reminder, McLean Research Day, see you next Wednesday. All right, so you may have noticed, um, for, well, first of all, I have to, my disclaimer is I always find it fascinating that you can speak around the world and speaking at home is always the most anxiety provoking, so hopefully I won't blow it too badly today. But <laughs> um, My title changed a bit. I, um, last year um, in the early fall, I gave grand rounds and talked really about some of our main core work on amygdala and fear, and I'll include some of that today. Um, also um, thought about talking more about some of the current collaborations with um, Melissa Kaufman and Sherry Winternitz and the Hill Center and um, the Women's Mental Health programs, but um, Lauren and, and Melissa have recently given great overviews of that. Um, so I was motivated by a new collaboration um, with the, um, the um, addictions program um, and division with, with Shelley and Hillary and Roger that we're putting together, as well as some work from Jung Su in our lab who's starting to put um, putting in an R21 as well for basic science models of alcohol addiction, that I thought this would be a fun opportunity for me to, to share some of our work over the years, really looking at the intersection of PTSD and addiction. And particularly the main thesis I'll, I'll leave you with is that though we, I think, clinically think about these as being highly comorbid, we may not often think about their shared circuitry and the way that they may have a very shared similar biology. And that's what I um, hope to leave you with today. So. I always start with, um, you know, both both fear and habits, as I'll be talking about, are conserved. These are basic processes for survival, and fear is certainly evolutionarily useful. We have very rapid um, circuit-based mechanisms for um, immediate reflexive responses to threats in our environment, and of course, these are critical for. Um, essentially all mammalian evolution. But what this leads to, I think, in our modern world is a whole set of anxiety-related and stress-related disorders. And I focus, our group focuses primarily on post-traumatic stress as one extreme of a fear-based disorder. And one of the things that over the years we've been thinking more about is as we do research on um, and talk to people who do addictions basic science research and we're focusing on fear and threat basic science research, is that we have very similar processes, particularly when we're looking at classical conditioning paradigms with aversive versus appetitive behavior, and yet we often have entirely different language and semantics. But the more you dive into that, you realize we're kind of talking about the same thing. And one of the, the questions I'll pose for you today is can we think of fear as a reflexive habit, just like um, addiction is a reflexive habit towards going approaching the cue. Fear, you're avoiding the cue. And we'll come back to that concept. But before I dive into the data, I will um, give you a brief primer on PTSD. So again, post-traumatic stress in the current DSM-5 nosology includes intrusions with flashbacks and nightmares. Of course, before any of this, you have to have had um, a significant um, exposure to a traumatic event. And another, I think, parallel that we may not often think about is with addictions, you have to have exposure to the addictive drug or alcohol. You can't be addicted to something if you've never had that inciting event, but it's how you then respond and your brain responds over time. 
With PTSD, people who end up with PTSD, the roughly five to 10% following a severe trauma, they can't seem to recover. And they have ongoing intrusions, flashbacks, nightmares, avoidance of places, people, um, negative alterations, depression, symptoms, poor concentration, and then this um, more um, anxiety, fear, cues of increasing startle, jumpiness, insomnia, etc. And one of the most common things you'll hear is I always feel afraid, I don't feel safe, I can't find safety. And actually Lisa Najovitz um, work on comorbid PTSD and um, addiction, you know, the title of that program is called Seeking Safety. So. Um, the first thing I thought I would do is just get us sort of on the same plane of thinking about patients with PTSD with a brief video from the PTSD Alliance. It was done a number of years ago, but I think still nicely describes in their own words. I was 18 when I was raped. I tried to put it behind me to get over it, but the truth is I can't. I feel nervous and jumpy. Sometimes I wake up in the night and I think he's there in my room. I knew something was wrong with me. I just didn't know what. And I didn't know what to do about it. He used to beat me up, especially when he'd been drinking. We've been divorced for two years now, but I still don't feel safe. I can't focus on things at work. At home, I just don't care. Since it happened, nothing makes me happy. Nothing makes me sad. I just want to be alone. I don't like to go out. See, I'm afraid of what might happen. I'm afraid I'll lose it. I'm not the person I used to be. I'm afraid I'll never be the same. Okay, so it's this set of symptoms that can be diverse but tend to have these common themes um, in the aftermath of trauma. And of course, the central question is why do some people develop PTSD following a severe trauma, whereas the vast majority, 90% don't. And we think that a significant component of this is genetic. And I will show some data a little bit later showing some of the more um, recent data, but years of work with twin studies, for example, has shown that approximately 30 to 50% of the differential risk for who develops PTSD versus not is genetic. And so a fair amount of my talk today will be giving you examples of where the field stands in both the genetics of PTSD, but also some early work looking at the intersection of genetics of addiction in people who who have been traumatized. And of course, the role of trauma is, is, is critical, um, but we also know that early developmental trauma, which is a big risk factor for all things in psychiatry, is a huge risk factor for PTSD as well, and those with a history of childhood trauma are more likely to develop PTSD following an adult trauma. But of course, trauma-related disorders are many, and though we tend to focus on post-traumatic stress, um, depression, anxiety, and of course addictions can all follow trauma as well. So the general themes I'll be talking about today are what are the um, comorbidities between substance use and alcohol use disorders in particular and post-traumatic stress, and how do we think about it? Um, there's the, comor the high level of comorbidity has been shown over and over again, and I'll show some of those numbers as well. But how does that work? So one, one possibility is that post-traumatic stress increases the risk for addictions and that at some level it's self-medication hypothesis and there's certainly plenty of evidence for that. But there's also evidence that addictive disorders increase risk for PTSD and I'll show some evidence for that. One of the things to be thinking about is this, a, a central theme will be the top-down regulation of prefrontal control of amygdala and accumbens driven reflexive behaviors um, is dysregulated in both of these disorders and that the disorder that's themselves feed into um, further dysregulation of top-down regulation. I'll talk about the shared neural circuitry, shared deficits and extinction or recovery, um, some of the concepts of habitual behavior versus goal-directed behavior um, and how those can be thought of similarly in both of these situations, and then maybe shared genetic risks or um, circuits that can be shared. So to so start with, um, the sort of canonical areas involved in post-traumatic stress are the amygdala um, really as the final common output of the fear response and its modulation or dysregulation in the case of PTSD between the prefrontal cortical areas in terms of top-down inhibition of the amygdala and the hippocampus in terms of providing both contextualization of information, specification versus generalization, and the ability to extinguish the fearful memory. 
And many of these same processes are happening, at least in the classical conditioning aspects of addiction. Um, and this is George Koob's um, summary of the various aspects of addiction from um, binging, withdrawal, and preoccupation and craving. But the critical part, and what he tends to call the dark side of addiction, is um, well-known data that stress and amygdala-mediated stress can also increase risk for relapse. Um, and I think the circuits that I'll be mostly focusing on are the um, hippocampal amygdala and prefrontal cortical amygdala roles in both of these disorders, as well as some on the role of the accumbens as well, which we generally associate with addictions, but how that may be playing a role as well in the um, recovery from fear. So the first data, a lot of the human data I show today will be from our Grady Trauma Project. We've, over the last 18 years, I guess, interviewed about 10,000 people in inner city Atlanta. Um, and this started um, as an observation that our general medical, our, our general mental health clinics in um, Fulton County Health System, which was the outpatient mental health center in inner city, central Atlanta, um, that we had high rates of um, trauma. Pretty much everybody we asked um, way they were traumatized, and yet their diagnoses were bipolar or schizophrenia or severe depression with psychotic features or her addiction. Um, so we did a little a small study of a couple hundred people while they were waiting in the waiting rooms, um, and we found that something like 40% um, of the people met PTSD criteria, but only about 5% of them had any mention of trauma or PTSD in their chart. And so that began the Grady Trauma Project where we said, this is an underrepresented and recognized thing. Um, we moved our interviews to the general medical clinics because a lot of the reviewers and people say, well, we know that people with severe mental illness have high levels of trauma. You're not telling us anything new. And we really thought we were seeing something that was more representative of rates of trauma and PTSD in general inner city populations. And so now, 10,000 people later, the numbers have basically held up. Roughly 40% of the people have um, post-traumatic stress. Um, about 50% know somebody personally who's been murdered. About 90 plus percent have experienced severe criterion A trauma. Um, so my, my joke there generally is, well, now you know why I left Atlanta, but, <laughs> but, um, but unfortunately that's really a, a, a numbers that we see um, in Detroit, in D.C., in Chicago, in L.A. This is an endemic problem of inner city America. So part of the goal of the Grady Trauma Project is to, is to put science to the problem of minority urban um, trauma and the, the ramifications. And one of those ramifications is increased addiction. Well, if you look at addiction rates, so this is about 600 people looking as a starting point, um, childhood trauma. So this is um, early trauma inventory, ETI, with one being you know, basically just quartile, one low, low trauma, four very high um, trauma. And again, these are combining physical, sexual, and emotional abuse. And what we see across all primary addictive categories is much higher rates of addiction um, in the case of those with severe childhood trauma. It's a well-known thing, but we see it here as well. And it really raises the question of, to what extent do the, do the um, addiction problems um, the, and the inner city cycle of violence issues at some level have as a core the untreated trauma? But what about the other side of that? So that, that sort of fits with the model of trauma's first, addiction follows. But is there something about addiction that also puts one at risk for not being able to recover from a trauma? So an, an, a relatively new study we began several years ago is identifying people in the emergency departments at um, Grady Memorial Hospital. And that's now led to a U01 project that will be um, followed up both at Grady and here at McLean, following people up after um, being um, enrolled at the emergency departments at Boston University, Boston City Hospital, and MGH. Um, but from the early data, we um, one study um, with John Zabrowski, who's now a resident here actually, um, was um, looking at people, um, their audit score, their alcohol use score, from the last year interviewed at the time of the trauma. So we said, okay, you just got traumatized. How much alcohol have you been using in the last year? Does that predict anything about your recovery? And it predicts, it highly associates with increased rates of PTSD symptoms, suggesting that a prior history of addiction may affect recovery. And one of the things I'll come back to several times is the, the, the hypothesis that the top-down regulation of, um, of, re of recovery, of extinction behaviors, is dysregulated in addiction, and that transfers to dysregulation of being able to extinguish fearful cues as well. So what are the areas we're talking about? So again, there's the medial prefrontal areas, um, which the most commonly talked about areas are the ventral medial prefrontal. CG25 is right here that Helen Mayberg talks about as being involved in depression. 
The anterior cingulate is often involved in enhancing fear, but both the ventromedial prefrontal and the orbitofrontal prefrontal are generally associated with decreasing, um, decreasing fear behavior. So we usually think of these as sort of breaks on the amygdala and this as enhancing amygdala function. And hippocampus can go both ways. Within the amygdala, you're getting lots of information. The basic idea is with Pavlovian conditioning is that a significant trauma acts as a conditioned stimulus. In a lab, we may use it as a tone for a mouse, but in humans, it's the car accident. The unconditioned stimulus is the bad thing happening. But in the person with PTSD, they've now paired the unconditioned bad outcome with the car, and now they avoid cars and driving and roads and that kind of thing. And the amygdala itself, after encoding this information, has hardwired outputs to numerous brainstem areas, leading to essentially all the symptoms of um, both fear and threat responding, but they can also be thought of as the reflexive symptoms involved in panic and anxiety. So increased heart rate, um, GI distress, ulcers, panting, respiratory distress, cortisol, et cetera such that this is one of the few places we understand in neuroscience and psychiatry where we have a known circuit with a specific hardwired set of known reflexive behaviors that we can nicely lay upon specific symptoms. And so I think that makes it a particularly tractable um, model in question. So again, the human, um, in humans, the amygdala has been shown to be dysregulated in fear and to be overactive in, um, in PTSD in multiple studies. This was one of the early studies. Um, of course, Scott Rausch had done a lot of the previous work um, in the 90s and early 2000s with, with Kilgore and others on the role of amygdala in PTSD. With Amit Etkin, um, he and Tori Wager showed that looking at fearful versus neutral faces gave increased amygdala activation on fMRI bold tasks across a host of different anxiety-related disorders, in particular PTSD. In our own group, we've shown this in several different ways. In this particular study by Jenny Stevens, again from the Grady Trauma Project, showed um, increased amygdala activation in those with PTSD versus trauma controls um, in an um, all-female um, traumatized cohort from inner city Atlanta. But interestingly, in addition to showing enhanced amygdala activation as a function of, of in fearful faces as a function of PTSD, we also see decreased subgenual um, activation. So again, consistent with the idea of less top-down regulation over the amygdala. In very recent work that's now impressed at biological psychiatry, we've further examined the emergency department study that I was telling you about. So within this group, we identify people in the, um, in the first four hours after a trauma, draw bloods, a whole host of things, see them at two, at two and four weeks later. And at four weeks um, later, we do a scan and they're doing a number of things, but one of them is um, looking at amygdala activation to fearful faces, the same task I just showed you. And then we continue to follow them up for symptoms at three months, six months, and 12 months. And the question is, is how their brain responding in the early aftermath of trauma that first month give us any prediction of what their PTSD symptoms might look like a year later? And um, she finds very nice data that their amygdala activation to fearful cues in the scanner is a strong predictor of whether they will have PTSD symptoms later. And not only is it amygdala activation, it's rate of um, anterior cingulate habituation, so that those who habituate faster also appear to have more symptoms, and that's to some extent consistent with a lack of ability of top-down regulation to be prolonged during the activation of fear, though that's just one hypothesis. So those are two pieces of data um, amongst many, many, many on the role of amygdala and PTSD. But there's also a literature on the role of amygdala and addictions. Um, and this is one particularly interesting study where they looked at um, a behavioral task um, in a scanner with an av approach versus avoidance alcohol set of alcohol cues in um, people with um, different rates of um, alcohol craving in an alcohol abuse and dependent population. And the take home message was their amygdala activation during the behavioral alcohol avoidance task was highly um, correlated with their level of craving. So again, the amygdala seems to be playing a role in whether you're having a fearful avoidance response or whether you're having an approach, appetitive craving response. I want to back up just a little bit and then now to sort of lay the groundwork for some of the questions we're going to ask um, and think more broadly, how does trauma, how do trauma related disorders, be they PTSD or addictions, how do they develop in the first place? And again, um, the first question is why do only about 10% of those who are traumatized develop PTSD at all? And 
The first part of that is genetic, we think, and I'll walk through some of the data on different ways to think about genetic risk for PTSD. There's also the aspects of how the um, trauma is initially encoded um, in that those who have more severe trauma are more at risk, but there's a whole host of things that happen in the hours to days later that put one at higher risk, including sleep, um, sleep consolidation, and then a, whole, um, a variety of things like social supports, um, negative affect, and other aspects in those early days. But after weeks and the, the, the um, symptoms start to develop, those who develop PTSD are more likely to generalize the fear response, they're more likely to be sensitized when they have fearful cues, and they're less likely to discriminate the fear or extinguish the fear. And I'll show examples of some of these things as we go. But the broader question first is, can we, by understanding the genetics underlying PTSD, can we better understand the biology and then have new targeted treatments? And that holds for, for all of our disorders. And more, more interestingly even, can the genetics give us information about the biology and the circuits in a way that we don't otherwise understand? So one way of doing the largest scale genetic discovery studies is genome-wide association studies. And in this case, what you do is essentially look at polymorphisms or genetic um, sequences about a million places over the whole genome. And then you ask, in an unbiased way, do the genes associate with the disorder? And schizophrenia is the area for which there's been the most progress so far, where there's um, about 150,000 total samples that have been looked at by the Psychiatric Genomic Consortium, of which the Broad plays a large, large part. Um, and with this, they have over um, 100 now polymorphisms that are significantly associated with schizophrenia and are starting to point to new biology of the synapse to help us understand that. And we're trying as a field to get there with PTSD as well. So there are three main broad ways that we can use genetics to associate with PTSD. One is the genome-wide association study, and I'll come back to that in a minute. The way that the field started you know, 10 or 15 years ago was candidate genes. I'm sure you all remember the serotonin polymorphism. Um, that was going to be the answer to everything. Um, and some early data suggested that CERT polymorphisms were associated with differential risk for, for depression as a function of childhood trauma. And that has held up to some extent, but has also been widely criticized that, um, for reasons I won't go into right now, but I can talk with in the discussion, about the statistics of how much you have to control for um, any given set of analyses. So there's really a debate in the field between candidate approaches based on biology and GWAST approaches based on unbiased um, approach um, ways, but we're really trying to have our cake and eat it too, if you will. <laughs> and so I'll show you a few different examples of how one can think about this. So one candidate approach, um, and again, even how you define a candidate, because if you define it in a partial hypothesis and then it rises to the top, was it truly a candidate or was it unbiased at some limited level? But FKBP5 is a protein that has been known for a number of years now to be involved in cortisol regulation. And specifically, it's a protein that binds the glucocorticoid receptor and prevents the cortisol receptor um, from going into the nucleus. So it serves as a negative feedback break, if you will, on the cell. And PTSD, we know, is a disorder in which the, the HPA, the cortisol stress system, is dysregulated. And plenty of data now has shown that FKBP5 as a protein is dysregulated. And um, some of the first data in PTSD by Elizabeth Bender and, and our group um, showed that it's a nice example of a gene by environment interaction. So if you have one version of the gene that's associated with, um, with dysregulated glucocorticoid receptor feedback, that version of the gene is associated with much higher PTSD symptoms in those who have high levels of trauma, in childhood trauma in particular, versus the other version of the gene seems to confer relative resilience despite childhood trauma. And this basic type of finding is held up in numerous studies across the world now. Um, I mean, Hariri showed that the risk allele is associated with more amygdala activation, um, and Nagarfani in our group showed that it's associated with dysregulated hippocampal function during fearful cues as well. Another set of um, gene pathways that we've been focused a lot on, um, and for which Bill Carlazon is, um, is leading a Conti Center um, proposal here, is PACAP. So um, this it stands for adenylate cyclase activating peptide. And the peptide that activates this receptor is called the PACAP receptor. It's been known for a number of years to be involved in the stress response, and it's upstream of the HPA cortisol response. So again, stress and the stress system are very central here. And we had shown that its, that its genotype is associated with PTSD in females, but not males. 
Um, we think of this as an intermediate approach because the way we first got to it was both a GWAS, but the GWAS was underpowered, so nothing survived 10 to the minus 8 sort of statistics that you have to have in a GWAS. But we overlapped the GWAS data with mouse molecular biology data saying what genes are differentially expressed in the mouse amygdala with fear. And are any of those genes that are associated with PTSD also specifically regulated with fear in the amygdala? And this rose to the top. But now it's been shown, this is again by Jenny Stevens, that this risk alleles associated with more amygdala activation, um, decrease hippocampal functioning, et cetera. So there have now been um, six total GWAS of um, PTSD, um, and all of these groups have come together to form the Psychiatric Genomic Consortium um, PTSD Initiative. We have something, I think, on the order of 70,000 total samples now that have been collected, and those data will hopefully be ready by the summer. And so the whole field, I think, is making great progress in this, and I think those who are interested in this area will have a lot of new um, candidates to choose from. But of the, all of these are ones that had moderate size sample, initial discovery samples, usually in the low thousands, and a nice replication sample and several of them are quite interesting in terms of the biology they point to. One of the most interesting first steps of the genomic consortium is to really validate the genetics, the genetic heritability aspect of PTSD. So this graph um, shows look, the genetics of PTSD versus schizophrenia, bipolar, and depression in two different ways. In red, we look at a, an amalgamation of the major, you know, basically a meta-analysis of the prior twin studies for these disorders. And in twin studies, we find schizophrenia and bipolar having about 70 to 80 percent heritability, and depression having about 40 percent heritability. PTSD, on average, is about the same as depression. But interestingly, if you break it up, females versus males, females seem to have a much higher heritability than do males. And we don't yet understand that. It may be the nature of trauma in females. It may be biology. But when we then look at GCTA heritability, this is based on the genetic polymorphisms, um, we also see pr um, robust heritability, although it's all lower. So with schizophrenia, bipolar, and depression, all see between 20 and 30 percent heritability, and PTSD also about 20 percent heritability. The reason that we see less with the, this approach than this approach is twin studies is essentially all things genetic and epigenetic. It's the rare variants, the common variants, it's deletions, duplications, and there's probably epigenetic components of it. Whereas the GCTA is just the common variants that are on these common SNP chips that are used for GWAS. Um, so that's very hopeful. It's, you know, the, the field, well, not the field, the psychiatry and outside had for a long time debated even the basic question, is PTSD biological? Is PTSD just a normal thing? How can you have a genetic component of a disorder that's related to trauma? And again, this helps support the argument that what the genes do is set up the brain to respond in different ways to the trauma, and a subset of people respond in a way that is not helpful for them. Also, um, we can use polygenic risk scores to show that PTSD has shared heritability with schizophrenia, bipolar, and depression. So again, what one of the take-home messages of the large-scale genetic studies suggests that we're going to find sets of genes that are basically general risk factors for, for psychiatry disorders in general, and then there'll probably be specific genes that follow for specific disorders. One of the first GWAS from Joel Gelertner's group at Yale um, showed um, a, a SNP related to PTSD that we um, replicated in the Grady Trauma Project. Um, and in this case, we found, again, a gene by environment interaction, as you almost always see in PTSD, because we know PTSD is partly a function of trauma level, such that um, in our cohort here, overall trauma level predicted more PTSD as consistent with previous data. But the carriers of the risk allele had higher rates of PTSD than the resilience allele. But the interesting thing was, if we then looked um, in their brains, we saw using diffusion tensor imaging as a way of looking at white matter connectivity, that the polymorphism associated with increased PTSD across these studies was associated with less white matter um, integrity in the uncinate fasciculus, which is the brain, the, the white matter tract between the medial prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. Um, so given that this is the path that keeps coming up over and over again, it's quite exciting that this particular genetic variant seems to associate with this intermediate phenotype of decreased medial prefrontal regulation. And we don't know a lot yet about COBOL, and we don't have any animal models yet, but it's thought it's cordactin blue, it regulates actin polymerization, and one could hypothesize that it's involved in um, axonal or dendritic regulation um, in these pathways.
Another um, study, this is um, ARDUAS, um, led by Lynn Almy and our group um, from, the Grady, from the Grady Trauma Project and Cohen Veterans Center um, at NYU finding another polymorphism significantly associated with PTSD. And this one was interesting because when we looked at fearful faces activation, we again saw at a whole brain level differences in um, dorsolateral and dorsal medial activation, which again come up over and over again in these disorders. Some new data that we're particularly interested in that I thought was relevant to today was um, we also looked at um, alcohol use um, based on the audit total score um, in this highly traumatized population with the basis hypothesis of in people who are both traumatized and alcohol abusing, do they have a unique set of genetic risk for their alcohol use? And we found one polymorphism um, that was significant and that replicated in several groups. This is, um, so we identified it initially in an all, Afri an all African American inner city population. It replicated in the marine resiliency study, so a marine PTSD study across um, G um, racial um, groups as well as a biomarker, a separate cohort. <clears throat> what was interesting is the, the SNP is closest to a gene and what would look like is in the, up, the upstream potential regulatory region of a gene called SLTC1. So what is that? Well, it's, it's a, it stands for sodium channel and clathrin linker. So the first thing that came to mind is there's, um, though most people think now that alcohol is generally playing a fun role either through direct GABA modulation or through inhibition of NMDA receptors, there's this whole other history with alcohol in terms of regulating sodium channels. Um, so that was interesting that that's what this is called. And um, what it turns out is that this, what this particular protein does is it's involved in clathrin, which is a set of proteins that cause endocytosis of, pro of, of channels. So it regulates sodium channel function, and it's, ex it's almost exclusively expressed in the cerebellum. We think a lot about the cerebellum with alcohol, but almost always it's related to Korsakoff syndrome and other extreme syndromes. And there's less data on is the cerebellum playing a normative role in early alcohol function. Um, and we were also able to show that this polymorphism is associated with differential expression um, in, um, in, in the periphery of that gene, suggesting that the SNP regulates gene expression levels. Finally, when we um, place the seed with functional connectivity, MRI, at resting state in the area of highest gene expression in the cerebellum, we found differential expression as a function of the genotype in the dorsolateral, medial, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Again, a region where dorsolateral prefrontal and cerebellum has been associated in a number of studies with, with alcohol regulation. So how to fit this into some of the other stuff, I'm not sure, but it's an interesting thing, we think, related to the intersection of, of trauma and, and drinking. What protects people from drinking? What protects people from, from PTSD? Well, we find the concept of resiliency um, is very important. Um, one of the things we struggle with as a field is, is resiliency simply the lack of pathology given trauma and given risk, or is it something orthogonal? One of the, there are not many really good tools for resiliency. One of them, the Connor Davidson Resiliency Scale, um, is, has been used, and in this case, we use the Connor Davidson Resiliency Scale to divide people into tertiles, low, medium, and high resiliency. And what we generally focus on um, affective and PTSD outcomes, but in this case, we looked at the alcohol and um, drug abuse, the audit and the DAST outcomes in the same at-risk population. And what we found with those who scored low resiliency on mood and affect were much more likely to have a child abuse by drinking interaction, suggesting that they were more sensitive to history of a trauma and more likely to be um, at risk for both alcohol and drug abuse but with high resilience, they were protected. Well, one of the main drivers of this resiliency score is positive affect. It's, it's feeling positive, feeling hopeful, having faith, things like this. So um, Elisa Wingo in our group looked at, um, did a GWAS with positive affect being the primary outcome. And this was using the positive and negative affect scale. It's the other panis as opposed to, um, and the, what she found was this particular SNP that met genome-wide significance. It was associated very strongly with both positive affect and with resilience on the CD risk, and negatively associated with negative affect, depression, and PTSD. <clears throat> what was particularly neat about this, other than A, it's cool if there might be genes for positive emotion, is that the SNP that it was closest to was this um, gene here. PTPRC stands for protein tyrosine phosphatase receptor type C. 
It's an unknown function, but um, you can gather from its name as a phosphatase is probably involved in a whole host of cell biology regulatory functions. But the cool thing is it's expressed almost exclusively in the amygdala. So the lab really hasn't done anything with this yet, but I think it's a really neat thing we should follow up on. Um, and what, what we did do is look in a, um, in a RNA-seq data set from Steph Maddox and Sumit Sharma, um, and what the, we found was that the, um, this RNA is significantly increased in its expression during fear extinction. Um, and again, if we, as we come back, fear extinction, one can think of as, as the opposite of fear or enhancing appetitive behavior. So when you're going, as opposed to, st when you stop avoiding something, you start going towards that thing. So I think there's a relationship between these two. When we looked at the same SNP um, in positive affect in the brain, she found that it significantly those who were associated with more positive affect were also associated with more accumbens activation when looking at positive pictures on an IAPS picture scale. So again, a gene that's associated with positive affect as a intermediate phenotype associated with more accumbens activation in humans and um, potentially regulating amygdala accumbens projections, which I'll come back to in the animal studies in a bit. Okay, so I've sort of given you a hodgepodge of um, how we can think about PTSD as a disorder um, and the neuro, neurobiology and genetics to some extent of how we're approaching this and the intersection. How can we start to get more at causality? And again, that's where translational models are particularly nice. What's interesting about um, the amygdala is that it's highly conserved across all vertebrate species. Um, and that Pavlovian conditioning in a mouse looks very similar to Pavlovian conditioning in a human, both behaviorally and in terms of amygdala activation. So most of our behavioral work focuses on mice, and we will use as a conditioned stimulus, say a tone or a light or a smell, and we'll pair that with an unconditioned foot shock. And what's happening then is that the, um, these two sets of signals are being, coming together within the amygdala, specifically the lateral and basolateral amygdala, and that then leads to this hardwired fear response. So several years ago, we started doing a number of studies where we said, let's look at amygdala regulation of plasticity and certainly look at fear behaviors, but let's also look at appetitive behaviors and just ask, are we is the same amygdala process regulating both appetitive and aversive or uh, approach versus avoidance behaviors? So this is a case where we did a targeted knockout um, of either, we either knocked out um, BDNF or we knock down the receptor for BDNF, the track B receptor with a dominant negative called track BT1. So in the knockout, if we look at fear potentiated startle as one mediator of, fe of fear responses, we find that the control animals, GFP, have significantly more fear learning than the Cree animals, which where we've knocked out BDNF. So this and many other studies have shown that BDNF dependent plasticity in the amygdala is required to learn fearful behavior. But if we take a similar set of animals where we've knocked out BDNF and we do condi cocaine condition place preference, and the basic idea here is you have three chambers, you put a mouse in one chamber, they get cocaine, you put them in another chamber, you do, they get saline, you do that for several days in a row. The mouse prefers to hang out in the chamber where you got cocaine because it made them feel better. <laughs> so you can show that they learn that, that association. If you knock out BDNF, you block the cocaine place preference in the same way that you block the fear conditioning. So you seem to decrease emotionally driven behavior, both in the approach and the avoidance way. And again, I talked about the dorsal anterior cingulate being sort of a, a signal that enhances amygdala function. And we think in, in rodents that the prelimbic cortex is the analog of the dorsal anterior cingulate. And lots of data have suggested that this prelimbic region projects directly to the basolateral and the central, and that it's associated with increasing fear. So we did a similar set of studies where we knocked out BDNF um, in the prelimbic and asked how does that affect appetitive behavior and aversive behavior. Um, if we knock out BDNF in the prelimbic, they learn to be afraid just fine. So this is five tone shot pairing showing how they're learning across the training. But then when we bring them back the next day, they, essentially, they show essentially no consolidation of that initial fear. They couldn't encode long term that fearful behavior. Similarly, if we do another cocaine place preference test, those who um, receive the BDNF knockout show significantly less cocaine place preference than do the control um, GFP virus animals um, knocked out in this prelimbic. So again, both the amygdala and the prelimbic seem to depend on BDNF track B plasticity for enforcing emotional consolidation, whether that's aversive consolidation through Pavlovian fear conditioning or appetitive through Pavlovian um, place preference. <laughs>
So that's the expression of fear and, and, and appetitive behavior addiction. What about the inhibition or extinction? Pavlov defined extinction as the process by which you learn to um, no longer, you basically learn the lack of reinforcement. And we think extinction in many ways supports cognitive behavior therapy and exposure-based therapy, that when you're re-exposed to something over and over again without the negative reinforcer, you are less afraid of it. And in many ways, you could argue that some of our addiction research is also exposure-based, certainly CBT-based. So um, we'd previously shown that BDNF in the amygdala is required for extinction. What about the role of the hippocampus? Um, this is a study knocking out BDNF specifically within the hippocampus. So this is the BDNF gene. This is the Cree recombinase showing you the same place we put the, this gene. Now that one's gone. If you knock out BDNF in the hippocampus, this is a normal GFP extinction response after an animal's learned to be afraid. Those in which you've knocked out BDNF have a deficit in extinction. So BDNF is really required across all three of this, this circuit, the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the medial prefrontal to both enhance and extinguish fear. One of the more interesting um, experiments um, about the role of BDNF in recovery from fear came from Francis Lee's group and B.J. Casey at um, Cornell. And they showed um, that the human, that there's a polymorphism in humans, um, a val-met polymorphism, in which the vowels, um, the met, has been, met allele has been repeatedly associated with decreased BDNF functioning. We now know at a cell biology level, it's not released as the pre-pro form of BDNF as efficiently. And in this particular case, they showed those with the met carriers had a deficit in extinction if they were trained to be afraid. They then made a transgenic mouse in which they, like Uwe Rudolph does, they took the entire um, human version of the BDNF exon, stuck it into the mouse, and showed that the MET version of the BDNF in the mouse also has a deficit in extinction, suggesting then that, um, that quantifiable differences in BDNF at a genetic level lead to differences in recovery from fear responses. <clears throat> So um, just one more set of, of mouse studies related to this. Most recently with um, Shannon Gorley, a collaborator at, at Emory, and Kelsey Zimmerman, who um, is now in Australia but was a graduate student, um, looked at the role of orbitofrontal cortex in, in um, behavioral flexibility um, and extinction behaviors. So she inserted, a, using a virus, a protein called the DRED, which allows you to inhibit cells. So in this case, this just shows the physiological activation. It's a GI DRED, so it's an inhibitory DRED. So when you give a drug to the animal that has this virus in its orbitofrontal cortex, you inhibit those cells firing compared to controls. So it's a way of, essentially, in sort of a science fiction-y way, you put in a virus, and you can take a pill and specifically affect just those cells that were affected with the virus. So um, what they did here is a standard um, study of habitual behavior that's a um, way of really looking at goal-directed versus habit-forming behavior. And many people in the addiction field that this, this is sort of saying, when, when, does the, when does the drug of choice become a habit and no longer something someone is seeking? And the way you do this in animals, um, in mice, um, in this case it's, it's supported with food pellets, but it could be um, a drug as well. So initially, they're able to nose poke in either poke um, spot is available and leads to a little food pellet. Then you do a non-degraded session where this um, hole is still supported. Then you block this one and you degrade this session. So now they're poking here, but they're not getting reinforced. Then you test them on both. The goal-directed animal has effectively degraded this one and not degraded this one, so you should see more poking here. And that's what they do right here. So the control animals, after you do degradation, poke more with the one that was non-degraded. I'm still not convinced this is not just a fancy word for ex fancy term for extinction. So that's what I think about. <laughs> that you've now effectively extinguished this um, hole, but not extinguished that hole. Okay, so now if you inhibit the orbitofrontal cortex while that's happening, the animals don't learn that distinction. They can't extinguish the, the appetitive behavior, and they act in a habitual way as opposed to a goal-directed way. They keep going towards the hole even though it's been extinguished. You take the same animal, same manipulation of orbitofrontal cortex, you do fear conditioning, and then extinguish them, and the take-home message is they don't extinguish nearly as well. So the same animals in which you've manipulated the activity of the orbitofrontal cortex have now a deficit in extinction of fear and a deficit in their ability to switch from goal, to habit or to goal-directed or to extinguish the appetitive behavior, depending on your terminology. And they could show that specifically as a, a negative correlation between the level of fear and the level of um, goal-directed behavior, effectively. <clears throat> 
and um, leading to the idea that the, the orbital frontal cortex is inhibiting this aspect of the amygdala related to the switching of um, negative versus positive or goal-directed versus habitual behavior. So I want to show in my last couple minutes one final set of studies that we think helps us think even more about. So I've talked a lot about the role of the medial prefrontal or the dorsal anterior cingulate and the hippocampus and the amygdala all as playing different roles um, with the accumbens and with the amygdala in terms of, of appetitive versus aversive behavior. But there's even evidence that the, even within the amygdala, you have these opposite strands of information, both positive and negative information or approach and avoidance information happening in parallel within the amygdala. And we may have to dive down to a cell type specific level to really understand this. So these are a number of different studies that have shown that you have both positive and negative information encoded within the amygdala. And this is my favorite example of that. Um, in which um, Andrea Sleuthi and Cyril Harry and Basel, Switzerland, recorded from mouse basal lateral amygdala neurons. They trained the mice to be afraid, and then they said, do these cells respond to fearful cues versus non-fearful cues? And they found about 30% of the cells responded to the tone. And of those, um, the fear neurons that they defined, they responded after fear conditioning. So they're, having, um, they're firing after fear conditioning. But if you now extinguish the fear, they don't fire anymore. A separate set of neurons they call extinction neurons. They don't fire to the tone before fear conditioning. They don't even fire to the tone after fear conditioning. But once you've extinguished this tone, now they fire. So they seem to hold the extinction memory. They hold the inhibition of the prior learned memory. So the question was, is this set of cells genetically definable, or is it stochastic? Can any given cell switch? So a whole set of things in the lab I'm not going to talk about today are focused on understanding these different cell types within the amygdala that may mediate these. But one set of these cells, we call the Phi-1 cells in the basolateral, we think represent that fear-off extinction population. So when you activate these cells, so this is a genetic driver in which one set of cells are labeled um, and an versus another, they make up about 50% of the pyramidal neurons within the basolateral amygdala. When you use optogenetics and drive these cells, you can drive them to fire very nicely. This is work with Tig Rainey at Emory. But if you then do a physiological experiment where you activate the lateral, as you would say, the, the, the condition stimulus information flow through through the lateral amygdala and record from the centromedial the output where the reflexive fear response would be, normally if you activate the lateral, a subset of, whoops, a subset of the, yeah. <coughs> a subset of the centromedial cells would fire. So this is that canonical flow through, CS coming in, output fear. But if you activate these cells at the same time, you inhibit that. So it suggests that you're inhibiting the flow through. Behaviorally, if you activate these Thigh-1 putative fear off cells, during fear conditioning, you completely block the consolidation of fear. If you extinguish the animals and activate the Thigh-1 putative fear off cells during extinction, you in significantly enhance extinction. So the cells act like your, um, that they're supporting the extinction memory and not the fear memory. Kenneth McCullough in the lab did a FOSS study in which he looked at how much these cells are activated either after fear conditioning or extinction. And those that we think are the fear off cells, in fact, have more FOSS activation after um, extinction. And those that are their neighbors, the CAM kinase YFP negative cells, they have more FOSS cells during fear expression. So both their normal activity with FOSS is consistent with the fear off population, and their, um, their, 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 when you manipulate them, they act like that. Well, the fun thing is, if you now look at their anatomy, so Kenneth um, injected um, a virus that only infected the cells that we think are the Thigh 1 fear off cells within the basolateral. And they don't project it all to the central amygdala. So again, the canonical story is the basolateral cells project to the central. But these don't. Instead, they project to the intercalated cells, which we think are involved in fear inhibition. They project to the infralimbic more than the prelimbic. And they, um, they project broadly through the accumbens. So it's a amygdala-dependent popu population that seems to be inhibiting fear, but that's driving accumbens um, populations, and that's tightly connected with the extinction circuit. Raising the question of, if we activate this population, would it support appetitive behavior and support addictive behavior? And is this part of at the cell type level where that switch between avoidance and approach is happening? We don't know that yet, but those experiments are in the, in the queue. So the model that I'll leave you with then 
is one in which the, um, this, this limbic circuit of amygdala as sort of the final common output of avoidance is, fine, is constantly driven and modulated by um, a number of cortical areas with the ventromedial and the OFC involved in inhibiting it, and the hippocampus through contextualization is involved in inhibiting its output. But that with the history of stress and trauma, um, we know that, st that stress mediating a whole host of mechanisms, including cortisol, block plasticity in these systems. And I showed you data on track BBDNF plasticity, and there's also data I didn't show you on NMDA-dependent plasticity. So that when you're not getting plastic regulation by these systems, the cues from the environment are much more likely to respond in a way that leads to reflexive stress responding, respect, reflexive fear, avoidance, and I would argue reflexive habitual behavior and substance abuse, depending on what cues have initially been associated with these responding, such that regardless of what's happening, our shared terminology of both diminished extinction, where the VM, these systems and these systems have the ability to extinguish the amygdala, or decreased behavioral flexibility. And that through recovery, be that um, through our traditional psychotherapeutics, be that through monoamine systems that lead to increased serotonergic regulation of the OFC, or through new ideas about directly modulating NMDA functioning or BDNF and track B functioning, that may allow us to have better top-down regulation of amygdala function, both increasing resilience, increasing approach, behavioral flexibility, and enhancing extinction. So I've walked you through a number of different um, stories. The main take-homes, I think, are that the comorbidity between trauma and addiction and stress that we see every day may have very interesting neurobiological and potentially genetic basis to it. And that um, the same way we think of increasing relapse with stress-induced reinstatement, maybe amygdala accumbens mediated, um, and the idea of threat responding may actually parallel the habit of addiction. We may have a habit of threat responding, if you will. And that may even be parallel in the same corticostriatal loops that we think about with motor functioning, with, um, with um, addictive behavior, and then you could even expand that to the habitual type behavior of avoidant threat responding. And that there's an intersection of maladaptive coping and decreased behavioral flexibility that may be very similar across both the addictive realm and the fear and threat realm. So I've walked you through quite a lot, and I'm really just the cheerleader for a great team. Um, a lot of the work I've shown you was, was stuff originally done at Emory and at Grady, um, and a whole host of new collaborations here at McLean that we're very excited about and hope to tell you about next time. Um, thanks so much for your attention today. A few minutes for questions? Yeah. If, if you can wait for microphones to come to you if you have a question. Hi, two questions. One, is there any behavioral change in a mouse whose BDNF has been knocked out genetically in, in terms of socializing and whatever mice normally do? And the second question just is, how do you measure relative neuronal activity with an electrode, post-sacrifice, uh, or imaging? How do you measure the various activities of the very close cells to each other? So for the first answer, there's a lot of behavioral differences if you knock out BDNF-dependent plasticity. Most of they just don't learn very well. So what's interesting is if they get stuck wherever they were. If you knock out BDNF before you train them to be afraid, they never learn to be afraid. If you train them to be afraid, then knock it out, they never learn to inhibit that fear. And that also happens with social learning as well. There's a lot of neat new tools for how do you do cell type specific physiology. One way to do it that I'll defer you to Jung who can tell you all about it in a future talk, in, but you can use these cell type specific markers to, um, so you can do a multi-electrode recording, for example, so you see a lot of different cell signals. Then you can use optogenetics to drive one of those cells and not other of those cells, and then you know which of those cell signals is that particular driver, and that way you, is a one, one way of several different, you can do cell type specific recording in a living, walking around behaving animal. Thanks for the talk, Harry. Uh, individuals with PTSD tend to self-medicate. So the correlation data you showed earlier, do you see that that could be a confound? Could be what? A confound. Well, I mean, I think, I mean, I guess I would totally agree with what you said, but I think 
I'm, when, when, we, when we say self-medication, I think we often think more of a dynamic way or other ways, and I'm saying there may be a neural basis for the self-medication because it may be that these, these, these circuits are driving that tendency to act in a more habitual behavior. And so what they, their own perception may be, I'm self-medicating, it makes me feel better, but you could all, it may also be that they're driven in a habitual way that they have a hard time controlling. Very nice talk. Uh, maybe uh, this is not related to what you talked basically, but I'm wondering if there is any sign of uh, neuroinflammation is also associated with the, with the PTSD or you know the mechanism you mentioned about. Yes, for both. There's a lot of interesting literature going on inflammation um, in both of these sets of disorders. Um, and I think the more we look at, almost anything that is stressful to the organism leads to increased neuroinflammatory responses in the brain. And how I think one of the really interesting questions is in the same way we're trying to understand at a hormonal level how stress hormones and other hormones affect specific circuits, how does neuroinflammation also integrate within specific circuits as opposed to just being a broad general bad thing? Um, if trauma is not, if the traumatic event is not fully encoded, um, do these changes in the brain still occur? Like for instance, if you know someone was um, date raped with a drug, would these things still occur? Great question. I'm not sure that I know data about it. I think you could broaden that question even to um, developmental trauma, right? Before people have, before people have ex um, you know, before three or four years old, you don't typically have a lot of um, declarative memories. And so I think one way of answering it without, without really having any data at all <laughs> is to remember that these are all parallel memory systems. And when we think just stoutly as a memory, we th sort of think of everything. But our, it turns out that our sensory memory is being encoded in parallel with our emotional memory, which is being encoded in parallel with our contextual and declarative memories. And so that we are likely forming some memory tracks even when other ones can't be, which may make it even more difficult to access them for treatment. Paper came out in Lancet, I think from Mass General, Hagerwal showing that amygdala activity was correlated with risk for development of cardiovascular disease. Fascinating that you're dissecting really on a micro level all of these st hormonal stress responses that really are expressed in terms of uh, the whole organism. The whole organism. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Now, I mean, as we know, both of these sets of disorders are put you at high risk for all things bad medically. And as you know, I think as we mature more into a systems biology approach and understand these are the specific way the brains are doing it, but it's really affecting risk throughout cardiovascular systems, inflammatory systems, and others. All right, thanks everybody.